Hi, I am Corey Miller, Dr. Corey Miller, President and CEO of Ratio Christi Campus Apologetics Alliance. On this episode of Thoughtful Christianity, we are going to be looking at faith as it relates to human sexuality and transgender and the church and culture. With me today is a great guest that uh, I've loved following throughout the years. Uh, he's a real firecracker, uh, a real uh, scholar, and uh, those two things don't always come together well. In this case, they do. Uh, Dr. Robert Gagnon is professor of New Testament theology at Houston Baptist University. He used to be, for over two decades, associate professor of New Testament at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. Did his undergrad at Dartmouth College, a master's of divinity at, or master's in theology rather, at Harvard Divinity School, and then his PhD at Princeton Theological Seminary. He's the author of uh, several books, The Bible and Homosexual Practice, Text and Hermeneutics, that's over 500 pages, and co-author with Dan Ovia of Homosexuality and the Bible, Two Views. I've seen both of these, done some reading in them, fantastic. Uh, he's written in Journal of Biblical Literature, the Catholic Biblical Quarterly, Novum Testamentum, New Testament Studies, uh, popular journals like the Christian Century and First Things, entries in New Dictionary of Christian Apologetics, we like that, Oxford Handbook of Evangelical Theology, and more. He's been published in the New York Times, National Public Radio, CNN, U.S. News and World Report, and much, much more. It's my pleasure to welcome uh, with us to the broadcast today, Dr. Robert Gagnon. Thank you. And you've given a sort of French pronunciation to the name, which is oh. okay. Gagnon <laughs> uh, is the way it should be pronounced, but we've bowed to the English-speaking world and we say Gagnon. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I have to deal with this every day with our organization, Ratio Christi. I preached to it at its church on Sunday and they did Ratio Christo, Ratio <laughs> Christi, Every I just let it go. <laughs> uh, so, thank you yeah, for having me on. By the way, yeah, it's a very much of a pleasure for uh, Rachel Christie. Look forward to uh, our staff being able to see this and interact with it, and our various audiences as well. So, let me jump right in to uh, one of the hot topics of our culture today, um, almost hotter than ever, and it seems to be making its way not just into pop culture, but now heavily into the church. Uh, when we look at this situation of homosexuality, one older Christian pastor who I don't think is serving in pastoral ministry anymore, Rob Bell, once quipped, this ship has sailed. Hmm. Um, you know, I know firsthand the cost of a publicly opposing this. I gave two views of homosexuality when I was teaching at Indiana University and had a former pastor who turned gay charge me with creating a suicidal environment. And if it weren't for some of my atheist students defending me, along with Alliance Defending Freedom, I would have been canned for sure. So uh, why should we engage in this uh, very divisive, politically charged issue uh, when there's so much at stake in, in our livelihood? And what's the cost of giving up on this debate? Hasn't that ship sailed? Well, unfortunately, it is sailing in a lot of different venues, mainline denominations, and sometimes even in evangelical circles. And there are a lot of evangelicals now who just prefer we not say anything about it. My uh, attempt to get a position after leaving Pittsburgh Theological Seminary in evangelical venues indicates that somebody like me is a hot potato that people often don't want to touch because they're worried about drawing attention to themselves on this particular issue. Right, but here's right. the big problem. You know, here's the uh, to me, it was shocking. I actually thought the evangelical venue would say, oh, gee, we're so thankful for the risk that you took writing yeah. what you wrote. Yeah. Which many other people who living uh, working in evangelical venues would not have risked anything to write about, but didn't. I did. And um, and it's really stunning for me to see the number of people that are fleeing the scene of the crime, if you will in order to avoid any persecution of the matter. But here's the thing. Uh, the, the issue that we ought to be concerned about is that for Jesus, this was a matter of concern. And for the entire canonical witness about sexual ethics, this is a huge concern. Uh, because every, every major element of sexual ethics, standards of sexual purity, derive ultimately from a male-female requirement for sexual ethics. 
And that's the flip side of the coin to a prohibition of homosexual practice uh, is the affirmation that there is a prerequisite for a sexual union. Hmm. And the foundational prerequisite above all other prerequisites for sexual activity is that there be one man and one woman in a holistic, integrated union of the two halves of the sexual spectrum, male and female. And when the church caves on that, there really is no possibility of them holding the line on things such as adult consensual incest Hmm. or adult consensual polyamory, because the basis for rejecting those is actually this male-female requirement, which lies at the very foundation of the sexual ethics that Jesus proclaimed, as does the whole witness of the canon. Well, you know, some might say, um, you know, with the rise of what we might call gay theology, I know that may be a pejorative term, maybe it's a happy term, (laughs) Uh, but intuitively, gay theology would seem to bear the burden uh, as it's more of a novel understanding of various passages. But a contraire, some would say, Look, the, we now have, as of 2012, the publication of the Queen James Bible uh, allegedly produced to prevent homophobic misinterpretation. Uh, so, you know, aren't there maybe new Greek and Hebrew terms that have been discovered uh, helping us to better understand certain Bible passages? Wasn't the term homosexuality first used in the Bible in the 1940s in the RSV? Doesn't that show that the traditional view is the novel view uh, that bears the burden. Didn't the Bible become anti-gay at some time? Well, I'm not against uh, new academic work on the subject. I've tried to do that myself on a regular basis. Um, For me, though, I find when I do more academic work, uh, I continually reinforce the orthodox position because that's where the evidence leads us. Uh, I guess now there is this new movie. Is it called 1946? Yes, which making this argument that 1 Corinthians 6, 9, um, that this introduction of a translation, homosexuals is a late translation, and it really has to do with prohibiting pederasty, sex with underage boys. Uh, that is one of the most ridiculous arguments I have ever come across. Now, not the issue about the translation homosexuals. I would agree that that is not the best translation of the Greek term, Arsenokoitai, which appears in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. And that's because the term arsenokoitai uh, is more expansive than simply the question of sexual orientation. It's prohibiting, it's basically referring back to the Levitical prohibitions of man-male intercourse. Uh, You shall not lie with a male, um, which in the Greek translation of the Hebrew text uh, would be arsen. Hebrews a car, uh, and um, you shall not lie with a male as though lying with a woman. Uh, and the word there for lying is koite, and which means uh, sexual lying with somebody, uh, or it could even mean a bed um, that you can lay on, but also is used as this active sense for sexually uh-huh. lying with another. And the term arsenokoitai is extrapolated from the Greek or Septuagint translation of the Hebrew Bible passages that prohibit man-male intercourse, using those terms for male and lying. And literally what that term means is um, men who lie with a male. He uses a, and I'm sorry for everyone to say this, but you know I can't avoid the Greek entirely here. The suffix implied is a masculine suffix, that's from which we get male. The term arsen from arsenokoitai means male. And the term koitai from koites is the um, personal occupational noun that's derived from the abstract noun koite, which means lying in those texts. What I'm getting at is if we want a literal rendering of that term in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, we're going to render it in such a way as to recall the Levitical prohibitions, men who lie with a male. What's important about that term is uh, it doesn't appear anywhere else in the Greco-Roman Mediterranean basin outside of Christian and Jewish circles. And we actually, the term as it's used in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, 
that's our first occurrence anywhere. But most scholars recognize that Paul is probably using a term that exists in early Judaism at the time. We do see the abstract related term in Hebrew appear in the Talmud when it actually refers to the Levitical prohibitions of man-male intercourse. And it talks about Mishkav Sakor, lying with a male. Uh, and there it says, uh, what does this prohibition mean? What does, um, what does the man mean and what does the male mean when we look at these Levitical prohibitions? And they say, well, the, uh, um, the male, the man obviously refers to an adult male and a male can refer either to an underage boy or an adolescent, or it can refer to an adult male, which is exactly what the term male means, both in Hebrew and in Greek. So it's not limited mm -hmm. by age. It's intended to be entirely encompassing to refer to any act of intercourse between a man and a male, a man and a male of any age, completely forbidden. And when we look at how Jewish writers interpreted the Levitical prohibitions, like say, for example, the Jewish historian Josephus. Josephus from the first century makes clear, that, says the law prohibits all intercourse between a man and a male, accepting as the only valid form of intercourse between a man and a female. So what is he prohibiting? He's not just prohibiting pederasty, he's prohibiting any sexual activity involving a male that does not then involve a female. In other words, completely all-inclusive. This is how Philo, first century right. Jewish philosopher, also interprets the Levitical prohibitions, and as well how he reads the Sodom text as well. In other words, if you want to, if you want to look at, here's a term Paul used, clearly extrapolated from the Levitical prohibitions which are as encompassing as possible, and which in the history of interpretation in ancient Israel and early Judaism are as broadly interpreted as possible. Any sexual intercourse involving a man and a male of any age is strictly prohibited. What's the alternative? The only acceptable alternative is intercourse between a man and a woman. Everything else is prohibited. So we know what the term means when Paul uses it in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Not only do we have all that evidence, but we also have the evidence of Romans 1, 24 to 27. So if we're going to say, gee, I wonder what Paul meant by asinokoitai in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. First thing to do is not ask what Paul said in Romans 1. Well, that's absurd because that's the premier text in which Paul talks about uh, lesbianism and 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 uh, the hom male homosexual life mm -hmm. and the kinds of arguments that Paul uses there make quite clear that he understands the prohibition in the broadest sense possible. First of all, he's also indicting lesbianism. Lesbianism is not known in the ancient world for being uh, particularly exploitative in the way that it's practiced, mm -hmm. i.e., with uh, as often happens in male homosexual relationships, sex with a, a male call boy or mm -hmm. sex with an adolescent. Um, that's not what primarily goes on in lesbianism. When you go, when you indict lesbianism, as Paul does in Romans 126, you're indicting every form of female-female intercourse, not merely exploitative forms, but the way in which it's normally done in non-exploitative fashions. Moreover, Paul clearly has in view in the background when his indictment of homosexuality in Romans 1, 26 to 27, clearly has in view Genesis 1, 26 to 27, or 1, 27 to 1, 28. We know that because when Paul is making his argument in starting in Romans 1, 23, he uses terms like human, image, likeness. He talks about birds, cattle, reptiles. And then he talks about male, female. That's eight points of correspondence between a few sets of verse in each text. This is what we call intertextuality. Well, you don't actually have to, Paul doesn't act, actually have to say, oh, by the way, here's why homosexual practice is wrong. It's not the definition of sexuality that we find in the creation text in Genesis 1. 
He doesn't have to say that. Instead, he makes eight points of correspondence between his discussion in Romans 1 yeah. and that text in Genesis 1. That's called so, an intertextual echo. So I, I suppose, um, so it's interesting how you would say then that the term homosexuality may not be the, the best one to use, but what we mean by it is clearly what the ancient authors meant and confirmed by Jewish philosophers, historians, rabbis, and so forth. Uh, what if someone uh, comes back and says, however, yeah, but, you know, this was just Paul. Paul was sometimes said to be a homophobe, uh, but Jesus never said anything about homosexuality. You know, hate or celebrate. That's what we say in our culture. What would Jesus do? Jesus never spoke on homosexuality. Uh, besides, didn't he teach us not to judge people? Well, that's why I normally start whenever I give a presentation on homosexuality in the Bible. I always start with Jesus. Mm. And then I move from Jesus to Genesis. And then I move from Genesis to the vertical prohibitions, the wider sweep of the Old Testament. And unfortunately, because of the order in which I do things, I hardly ever have any time for Paul. <laughs> but that, that's OK, because I've already made my case and everybody knows that uh, that's the, the easiest case you can make is from Paul. If you made it everywhere else, it's an obvious conclusion. Yeah. Now, what it, it's true that Jesus didn't directly address the issue of homosexual practice. Right now, he also didn't directly address the issue of incest. Right. Correct. She, WWJD, what would Jesus do about incest, right? Yeah, I wonder. Mm -hmm. It's a real, <laughs> real problem for me to figure that out. Um, and nor did he directly address polyamory or his version of uh, polygyny, multiple wives, a form of polygamy. Now, do we have any questions about what Jesus' view on such issues are? Absolutely not. What did Jesus do? Jesus addressed the remaining loopholes that existed in his cultural environment on sexual ethics. Early Judaism was very strong on the whole with sexual ethics. They only had a few loopholes that had to be closed. One was the issue, and we can see this in Jesus's six antitheses in Matthew five, two of which have to do with sex, the adultery of the heart, one, and the divorce remarriage text, right? Those are the remaining loopholes, okay? The scripture is quite clear about various forms of sexual immorality. Didn't addre directly address the issue of, well, what if you have a temptation to commit sexual immorality thought-wise, but you don't actually engage in it in your behavior? Well, what Jesus did is he reached deep into the interior life, and he said, you don't even get a pass for that. That is what you think also you could be held culpable for. And then he dealt with the issue of divorce and remarriage. Now, of course, we know in early Judaism, in ancient Israel and early Judaism, that um, women did not have the right of unilateral divorce. And nor did women have the right to multiple husbands concurrently. Only men had those rights. Now, how did Jesus describe these rights when we look at his discussion in Mark 10? Jesus said, God allowed this because of what? human hardness of heart right this was not god's creational intent and this i always love this text because whenever i debate with somebody else and now it's hard for me to find anyone to debate me it's been years because i don't know somehow the message has gone out don't debate this guy i i would be happy to debate anybody matthew vines uh, any figure at all scholar actual scholar um but they all, none of them will debate me because why? They know I'll clean their clock. Well, why will I clean their clock? Not because I'm anything special, but because the biblical evidence is absolutely overwhelming. And one of the things they used to say when people did debate me on this was what Dr. Gagnon doesn't understand, I always love when they start with that, doesn't understand is that we've, we're have in a new covenant. So we're not bound by the strictures of the old covenant any longer. And uh, things have changed. And you know what? I say, you're exactly right. Things have changed. Jesus himself brought about change. But what you're failing to do is realize the direction in which the change goes. Not to greater sexual license, but to greater 
demand on God's part for mm. sexual purity. Mm. So what Jesus does, and it says a lot about Christology, by the way. Yeah, I always like to get in the Christology angle in at the same time. Jesus thought he could unilaterally amend the constitution of Israel given to Moses at Sinai, right? Try to try to amend the U.S. Constitution unilaterally. <laughs> we have wonderful padded cells that you can be put in when you do stuff like that. Well, Jesus thought he could actually amend what God gave to Moses at Sinai unilaterally on his own part without any appeal to prior authority because he had no prior authority that would allow him to make mm -hmm. that appeal. And he did so in such a way as to close those remaining loopholes. So Jesus said, yes, I, I am advocating change here. God used to allow men this option, both of uh, serial polygamy, divorce and remarriage for virtually any cause, depending how you interpret the text in Deuteronomic law in Deuteronomy 24, and also concurrent polygamy, any number of wives they're entitled to have. Now he said, I'm closing that loophole. Now we have to ask, how did he close that loophole? How did he justify closing that loophole for men? He didn't have any loophole there to close for women because women never had those options, either in terms of concurrent or serial polygamy. But for men, he did. And on what basis? He cites two texts, as you know. Remember what two texts he cites in Mark 10? Genesis 1.27, and only one third of that verse, male and female, he made them. Then Genesis 2.24, therefore, for this reason, a man may leave his father and mother and become joined to his woman or wife, and the two become one flesh. Now, why does he cite those texts? Of what possible relevance do those texts have for what Jesus wants to do? Because what Jesus is doing here, most people don't realize, is he's, he's doing a number thing here. He's limiting the number of partners allowable in a sexual union. He's basically saying to men, look, if you give your wife a certificate of divorce for any reason whatsoever, and you remarry after divorcing your spouse, what does Jesus call that? Calls That's that adultery. adultery. Now, it can only be adultery if Jesus presupposes that the original union is still intact that the certificate of divorce doesn't actually change the reality that that union is still intact in God's eyes. So yeah. that if you pick up an additional partner beyond that one other partner, the whole union involving only two people, that's now going to constitute adultery, whether it's concurrent polygamy, divorce and remarriage for any cause, or serial, excuse me, serial polygamy or concurrent polygamy what we typically call polygamy. On what basis did Jesus limit the number of partners in a sexual union to two, whether at any one time or serially? Go back to Genesis 127, the one third that he cites. Male and female, he made them. Now, this is what I ask people. How many sexes are involved in that formulation in Genesis 127? Clearly two, male and female. What's the only thing in common between the two verses that Jesus cites? Genesis 1, 27 and 2, 24. The two sexes. Therefore, in Genesis 2, 24, a man may become joined to a woman and the two become one flesh. Okay? So, huh, where does he get the number two? I pause when I talk to people about this. This is a tough one. Where does he get the number two? Where does he get the limitation of two persons to a sexual union, such that if you pick up a third party, it constitutes adultery. Hmm. Male and female, man and woman. This is a tough one. Well, it's kind of obvious. I'm joking around a little bit here, but it's clear that Jesus is making the sexual yeah. binary intended intentionally by God in creation as the clue for what God requires in terms of limiting the number of sex partners in a sexual union. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. I, when we're talking about the, the covenants and you're drawing an integration from Jesus to Genesis, um, 
I think it was Augustine who said that um, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So you have this integrity there with the text, but how 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 serious should we be about this issue? Because I've got a, a friend here at Purdue who is a, a gay cleric. We connect about once a year for lunch and talk about uh, some of these things. And I remember him saying to me one time, look, you guys uh, of the more traditional element make such a big deal about this. There are only about six verses on homosexuality, but about 600 on heterosexual sin. So if homosexuality is just one sin among many, and the real focus is on heterosexual sin, aren't we just being preoccupied with sex here? I've heard people accuse you of that. I know they've accused me of that. Aren't Christians well, just preoccupied with sex here, going after homosexual sex? Well, there are many answers to that. First, I want to go back to Jesus and say what Jesus is doing is saying, if you find, if you find remarriage after divorce, uh, let me put it this way. He's arguing, look, we have another group of Jews in early Judaism called the Essenes. It's the Dead Sea Scroll Jews we associate them with. They're so rigorous in their observance of the law that they thought that the Pharisees were wimps when it came to observing it. Uh -huh. Now, they developed a view appealing to the same one third of Genesis 127, male and female, he made them to say no more polygamy. If you're a member of our group, and you belong to the town Essenes who are allowed to marry as opposed to the monastic ones, you will not be allowed to practice polygamy anymore because male and female, he made them. And they said, this is the foundation of creation. And that is exactly how Jesus is mm -hmm. treating Genesis 127 and 224. It's the foundation of all sexual ethics. Mm -hmm. Now, he doesn't prohibit polygamy polygamy directly in that discussion in, in Mark 10, but that's implicit because if it's adultery for you to marry again after you've divorced your spouse, mm -hmm. how much more is it adultery if you don't get rid of your first spouse, right? Mm -hmm. Which is easier to prohibit, uh, polygamy or remarriage after divorce? It's clearly easier to prohibit polygamy. In our society, we prohibit polygamy. We don't prohibit not, not if you're from form. Utah like me. Yeah, well, that's right. Which, <laughs> and the times are going to be changing too yes, beyond the are. Mormons. Uh, that's already coming. That's the next thing coming down the pike mm -hmm. in order for them to be more internally consistent. But the reason why polygamy is easier to prohibit is we all recognize polygamy is worse than remarriage after divorce. What the Essenes did, citing Genesis 27, was prohibit polygamy. Jesus outdid even them in sexual rigor by prohibiting the remarriage after divorce, which implies that he's prohibiting the polygamy. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is this friend that you eat with, is he arguing for you that we should now accept polygamy, multiple partner unions of any sort? No. In, in fact, when I started asking him about all the new letters added to the alphabet, LGBTQTTIA, <laughs> he put his hand on his head and he looked down and he says, I know, I know where you're going with the logic of it. I get it. But there's just something in my gut that that kind of sex is just wrong. <laughs> yeah. Well, then, then he's going to have a problem with Jesus. Because the basis yeah. for Jesus rejecting polygamy and unrestrained divorce and remarriage for any cause is the male-female requirement. It's the two-ness of the sexes that Jesus said that is the basis for limiting the number of partners to two, whether at any one time or serially. So let's say this person that you eat with, this gay pastor, obviously he doesn't accept the fact that there's a male-female requirement for sexual ethics, right? Apparently. Apparently, I mean, if he's accepting homosexual unions, he doesn't think you have to have a male and a female in that bond. Mm -hmm. How is he gonna reject polyamory now? If Jesus said the basis for polyamory is the rejection of a male-female requirement, or the basis for rejecting polyamory is the recognition of the logic of a male-female requirement, then the only conclusion that one can draw is 
polyamory or polygamy is not the slippery slope that we might get to if we accept homosexual practice, as though polygamy were worse. The worst thing is the rejection of the male-female requirement. That's the foundation upon which any limitation to two persons is based, according to Jesus. All right. So when people talk about, we don't talk, we don't see many texts directly speaking about this in scripture. First thing I want to say is every text that we do have directly speaking about it indicates its pivotal significance. Second thing I want to say is the echoing of the text to the broader view of sexuality. So we talked about if Jesus regards a male-female requirement as yeah. foundational, then it doesn't matter how many times it's spoken about. Thirdly, what is his appeal to? Creation text, which we just briefly alluded to in Genesis 1 and 2. If you want to look at a if you want to look at the flip side of the coin from a prohibition of homosexual practice, again, the flip side is a male-female prerequisite. Every single narrative, law, proverb, poetry, metaphor in the scriptures, old and new covenant that have anything to do with sexual ethics always presuppose one thing, a male-female requirement. There is never any exception. So what does that indicate? That this is only a minor issue? Mm. It's a major issue. Mm. It's so, and, and the uh, other thing is, the reason why it doesn't have to be mentioned a lot and shouldn't be mentioned a lot is because it's scandalous. It's that extreme. It's like bestiality. You don't need like to mention bestiality. it. Like How many times have you heard a pastor give her a full sermon now <laughs> on why you shouldn't have sex with your mother? Have you ever heard that? <laughs> no. Let alone bestiality? Yeah. Have you ever concluded from that that they have some secret acceptance of sex with your mother? Right. Yeah, the reason why they don't talk about it is because it's scandalous to even have to mention it. Mm -hmm. That's the viewpoint of the biblical text. Mm -hmm. So Jesus isn't going to go around and talking about why you shouldn't have sex with a member of the same sex. There is no Jew who is advocating for that mm -hmm. within centuries of either side of the life of Jesus. Why? Because they know it's unequivocal. Why do you not have a lot of laws in the Hebrew Bible prohibiting same sex intercourse other than the ones you have in the Levitical prohibitions? Because that's all you need. Why do you have a lot of laws regulating? There heterosexual intercourse, because there are good and bad forms of heterosexual intercourse. You don't need a lot of laws prohibiting homosexual practice because there are no good forms. Hmm. There's no need to explain further out. What, That's a good point. You know, like, like with incest, when does incest cease to be incest? Like if you have sex with a cousin, is that incest? It's not actually. But how about sex with a half sibling? Is that incest? It is incest. Now, the reason why incest gets a lot of prohibitions, a lot of commands, is because you've got to regulate the boundaries. The boundaries are porous. Where does incest begin and end? There's no question about where homosexual practice begins and ends. You only need a single prohibition. That's it. And it's regarded as extreme. It's the only one in Leviticus tagged with toava, an abomination, something abhorrent or detested by God. All the sexual offenses are then called that in Leviticus in the summary statement at the end of chapter 18. But before the summary statement, this is the only one tagged that way. It's in a first tier of sexual offenses in Leviticus 20 when the penalties are given. It's in, when Ezekiel reads the Sodom text, he reads it in light of the Levitical prohibitions, which he knows from the Holiness Code. A lot of correlations between the Holiness Code and Ezekiel as a priest prophet. He knows mm -hmm. the Holiness Code in Leviticus 17 to 24. Uh, and so he's actually reading the Sodom text in light of that. The Sodom text has many other sins involved, no question about that. But a key element in the indictment of Sodom, if it's read in its historical context and by how it's interpreted in subsequent history of interpretation, say by, uh, by Philo, by Josephus, his Jewish mm -hmm. authors of the first century, or by Jude in 2 Peter, or as I said earlier in the Old Testament, by Ezekiel. All of them understand to be a defining element for this catastrophic destruction and an attempt to dishonor the masculinity of the male visitors by treating their masculinity as though it were non-existent. So we've got whatever text that has any reference to this always indicates this is a particularly severe text. And otherwise, we want to stop talking about it. 
because it's so scandalous to mention it. That's a great point. Well, so moving on then, um, not just talking about gender, you know, we hit the second wave of feminism in the 60s, and and now we've gone through the third wave. Some say that we're into the fourth wave. Uh, but then you hit homosexuality, and it became something uh, of a vogue behavior and, and kind of popular. Uh, but once Caitlyn Jenner or Bruce Jenner came out, not on the Wheaties box, but on, I think, Vanity Fair magazine, it seems like uh, this transgender issue has trumped both feminism and homosexuality and a whole lot of other issues. You know, I uh, began my doctoral studies in philosophy at Purdue University, but I culminated the PhD at the University of Aberdeen. During my um, defense, um, I had a professor of philosophy, a department head, a moral philosopher who had written on St. Augustine's ethics, on virtue ethics, and he was transgender. In fact, he was going through the um, reassignment during the time I was going through the, the preparation and then wrap up of, of the defense, so much so that, um, you know, it was such a serendipitous moment for me in some respects. After I finally completed the PhD there, uh, you start to have that issue trump homosexuality, and, and now everybody wants to be transgender. They don't want to be cisgender, you know, go based on your, your birth um, report, but transcending that. Um, so you get now feminists who are upset about this. You get people like J.K. Rowling, who wrote the famous Harry Potter series, upset that the trans movement seems to be trumping feminism because you've got to have uh, a female, a woman, not a woman or, or anything like that, but a woman. And so he writes this article, you can Google it, I think last year in The Guardian, thanking J.K. Rowling uh, since having four children growing up, he read all of the Harry Potter series to her, but it was her creativity that gave him the freedom. Uh, someone who was actually in the leadership of the Church of Scotland, an Augustinian moral philosopher, came out and said, it was your writings that helped me have the courage to become the identity I really am. And now I am I boast it of being the first transgender philosopher in the UK. So <laughs> I defended in front of Timothy Chapel. I tried to look up his CV after the uh, dissertation defense. I couldn't find it. It had changed to, to Sophie Grace Chapel. So this seems to be a, a trumping issue now that homosexuality is sort of passe now. Um, sex is now said to be just biological, gender psychological, or even sociological, since, you know, isn't knowledge just a social construction of reality? Does the Bible say anything about gender? How is the Christian supposed to be equipped for this one? Well, the Bible says things about uh, men who attempt to erase their masculinity and to become female. So uh, we have, for mm -hmm. example, everybody knows the text in Deuteronomic law that refers to also as an abomination, a man who dresses as a woman or a woman who dresses uh, as a man. And part of what's behind that is a series of texts that we also find in Deuteronomy, uh, but also elsewhere in what we call the Deuteronomistic history, the material from Judges through uh, Joshua through Second Kings. And these are figures who identify with a goddess figure. You usually find it translated in English translation, something like homosexual cult prostitutes or something. But literally the term in Hebrew, Kadashim, just literally means the uh, uh, cult figures. And it refers to cult, cult figures, cult figures that yeah. men who are associated with an androgynous deity and who are attempting to emasculate their masculine features mm. in dress, sometimes as far as castration, um, in, in order to have sex with men. And uh, they experience it as something that the goddess has possessed them. And therefore, this is who they are in reality. And uh, this is something referred to in, in Deuteronomy, in the Deuteronomistic history, also as an abomination. And we find Paul referring to comparable figures in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, when he refers to the Malachoi, which literally means soft men. 
And it's men who actively, again, emasculate themselves to attract male sex partners. And we have Greco-Roman equivalents to that also, both in the ancient Near East and in the Greco-Roman world. And in Christian, or Jewish and Christian circles, this is regarded as even worse than the issue of homosexual practice. Now think about what the logic is of homosexual practice, right? Think about what the logic is of heterosexual sex, right? Mm -hmm. The two halves of the sexual spectrum, male and female, unite into a single sexual whole. Well, if you're instead not uniting with, if let's say a man, if you're not uniting with a woman sexually, but rather with another man, what is the implicit logic behind that? Well, if the logic of the heterosexual union is the two halves of the sexual spectrum unite into a single whole, the logic of a homosexual union, if the two parties are men, is two half males unite to form a single whole male. Or in the case of women, lesbian unions, two half females unite to form a single whole female. The person with whom you unite sexually, you perceive as the other half, sexually speaking, of who you are. Mm -hmm. That means, this is why it's not accidental or unusual then, that in many cases in homosexual unions, one or more of the parties experiences a great deal of gender nonconformity. And they experience their sexual identity as other or exotic in relation to members of the same sex. And as a result of that, they're perceiving that their deficit Take an example, a man, a gay man, his deficit in his understanding of his own masculinity will be met by uniting with another male, filling in what is lacking in himself. Unfortunately, what that actually does is it actually regularizes the misunderstanding mm -hmm. that he's only half male. Because in reality, of course, he's not half his own sex. He's half of a whole sexual spectrum involving male and female. That's why Paul uses the language in Romans 1 of dishonoring themselves because they treat their essential masculinity of male or essential femininity of female as only half intact in relation to their own sex. Now, when you think of the issue of transgenderism, it's not merely a, a view that I'm only half my own sex. It's a complete and total rejection of one's biological sex. It's a hundred percent rejection of it. Now you're trapped in a body that you ought not be trapped in. Right, allegedly. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, as we all know, biologically, they're male. If male, born as a male, or biologically female, if born as a female, they're not going to change their chromosomes. They're not going to change the essential identity of who they are. And in fact, they still act like members of the sex that they come from. Take, for example, the person you cited. Mm -hmm. Um I'm blanking on his uh, Bruce Jenner. Uh, yeah. I remember Bruce Jenner when he won the decathlon. I'm old enough to remember when he did that. Watch that on TV, right? Mm -hmm. So he, he allegedly becomes a female. What does he do? First thing he does, he, he shows himself in his underwear in Vanity Fair. No, that's a man. That's a man <laughs> thinking. And why does he do that? He's erotically aroused by the sight of himself dressed as a woman. There are two different kinds of transgender or transsexual persons. And he fits the type that's called autogunophilic. Auto meaning self, gune meaning woman, and philic from love. He has internalized an ideal image of a woman. And he's erotically aroused by that internalized image. And he fits the profile of a person who doesn't transition well into the other sex. <laughs> usually from an occupation or behavior that's not typically female, usually de male decathlon, Olympic gold medalist. You wouldn't think as, you know, identifying right. as a woman. So the transition is harder for them than what we would call a homosexual transgender. And, and he, he still behaves like a male. And he's still, incidentally, attracted to women. To women, right. Right. <laughs> so he's still, in a sense, defining himself as a man, even as, but he gets this erotic arousal. Yeah. And almost certainly, he likes to look at himself in a mirror dressing as a woman. And he probably has a mirror over his bed because this is typical for the <laughs> autogodophilic transsexual. They get aroused by that sense, but that's weird. And now who's the last time I heard he's dating what? He's dating, he's dating 
he's dating a uh, what now? He's dating a transgender female. In other words, a male who identifies as a female. So now it's in effect. The reality of it is it's a homosexual male relationship. Confusion. But it's complete <laughs> confusion because they're both, you know, transition allegedly to a female. So yeah. it's technically it's by their own subjective orientation, a lesbian relationship. Well, the whole thing is bizarre from the get-go. They're both men is what it comes down to. And they both actually, oddly enough, have an attraction to women still because that's typical of an auto good of feeling. Transsexual or transgender person, they're still attracted to the other sex. He's not changed anything about who he was. He's denied who he actually right. is. And that's a denial of the creator, even more extreme than homosexual practice. But as you've noted, it creates even a greater problem for religious liberty, right? Right. Because we have Absolutely. to call them by their pronouns and by their made up faux gender specific name um, for the yeah. gender that they actually are not. Right. And Jordan, you get Jordan, big trouble. Yeah, you get Jordan Peterson types now uh, in America. We've got uh, a couple of Christian philosophers who are being challenged to call students by their preferred pronouns. And if they don't, they've got problems. My um, student uh, in high school last week, her biology teacher had them all go around the classroom, give their names, but then also give their preferred pronouns. But <laughs> I mean, for a lot of the biologists, we, we like to appeal to them, the sciencey type and say biology is not bigotry when it comes to, you know, the trans issue. I've got a a friend who is a an atheist philosopher, and he tells me that one of his family members is gay. He says that that's I have no problem with that. I think you ought to be able to have sex with whoever, whatever you want. I don't believe in sin, but this trans stuff is just nuts. Yeah, There's no science behind it. Yeah, so you've, you've it, got this fracturing within that uh, you know sort of progressive camp too. Yeah, it about, leads what? it leads to the worst form of violations of religious freedom and free speech because. It leads to um, not just shut up, but it's compelled speech. You actually have to use the terms that they want you to use. Now, if a Christian does that, that's basically from, from the vantage point of ancient Israel, early Judaism, early Christianity, this would be regarded as blasphemy, as a blaspheming of the creator, because the creator doesn't view them that way. And the creator views, in fact, regards their attempt to erase the identity, the gender identity that God has actually imparted mm -hmm. to them in creation and in at their birth. He view, views that as an, an attempt to reject God's role as creator. And therefore, it's a form of idolatry and it's a form of blasphemy. No Christian would ever think to refer to a man who's attempted to emasculate himself and to appear as a female, would ever think to refer to them by feminine pronouns or by a feminine gender-specific name. The only time they would ever refer to them in a feminine sen sense, we know by looking at early Jewish writers referring to such figures, like Philo, who does, and he, he reserves his greatest derision for men who attempt to emasculate themselves. And... Uh, for them, it would just be regarded, again, as the height of blasphemy, and it would be participating mm -hmm. in the law. Right. Uh, we're kind of coming to a close here, but maybe you can say something briefly about uh, something that is biological, but it seems to be a really hard case. Uh, we've got genuine cases of people they would call intersex. Uh, how does the Christian deal with something like that? It's not just making it up in the mind. You've got what appear to be confused parts on the body. Yeah, this happens. And we don't think of this as nature working well. Mm -hmm. We think of this usually as some problem has developed um, in the womb or otherwise. And we don't allow that issue that um, which involves a very small number of people. Mm -hmm. Actual most intersex cases are not ambiguous. An individual usually leans very strongly in one sex or another sex, even if there may be some ambiguity on the corners. But um, it's the idea of complete ambiguity is almost non-existent. It's so rare. Usually what you'd have, for, for example, a male, XY male, but there's two Xs. Um, or there are other kinds of syndromes like that where there's an extra Y or something of that sort for women. 
an uh, old woman would have a Y, but three X's or something. No, yeah. Actually, that's even confused. Anytime an individual has an X, at least one X and one Y, it's a male. And there may be some ambiguity in terms of the way it manifests itself, if they have an extra X and so forth, but it doesn't change the basic reality that they're, gen they're generally male. Um, we don't, for example, let's take the example analogy of Siamese twins or conjoined right. twins, right? How do, how do conjoined twins have sex if they don't get separated? How do you call, ask somebody to leave the room, right? <laughs> I can't exactly ask right. my twin. Okay, you know, I'd like to be intimate with my my uh, spouse here. Could you please yeah. leave? No, I, I can't really do that. Well, how does that all work? It seems to it seems to threaten the whole concept mm. of monogamy, right? Mm. But we don't allow the existence of conjoined twins, the extreme exception to the general rule, to implode the rule. We understand no monogamy still the number, limitation of two persons through a sexual union. We're going to go with that, irrespective of conjoined mm. twins. And the same thing with the so-called intersex. You get actual completely ambiguous persons. We're talking about fractions of fractions of 1%. And we don't allow that to eliminate the importance of a male-female binary from the get-go. And incidentally, persons who identify as homosexual aren't usually intersex. And persons who identify as transgender aren't usually intersex. So those issues have absolutely nothing to do with the intersex. We look at the intersex and we say, Something happened here in the process of nature where something didn't work well. That doesn't create a new definition for us. And it doesn't even really create a third sex. You just get somebody who gets a little extra part of the other sex, but it's not a distinctly different sex. And how do we know that? There's no possibility for procreation outside of a male-female paradigm. Those are the two sexes that God intentionally mm. created as such. And anything else is due to the fall. Mm -hmm. We don't say that there's something wrong with a person who's into that they're to blame for some of that. Sure, like but, a person born blind, right? Like a person born that. blind. I was born short. Who do I take that complaint to, right? <laughs> you know, when in the kingdom of God, that's going to change. That's what I'm figuring out because, you know, yeah. great reversal at the end. I'll be tall. I don't know what your height is, but if you're tall, you'll be short. That's the way it's all going to work out, right? I don't I don't blame anybody for that. And I'm not to be blamed for that. It's just the way it worked out. Right. None of us are born perfect in the construction of who we are. But it doesn't change the fact that there's something that God sets in place that we have clear evidence in nature for as well. When the natural processes work well, that provide us as definitions for how we look at male, how we look at female and how we order society accordingly. We don't make the extreme extreme exception uh, an ability to implode the rule. Right, right. Well, let's look, let's wrap this up with a, a final question. Um, our culture is radically changing. We are living in nothing short of a cultural revolution, in my perspective. Um, politics, they say, is downstream from culture, and culture is downstream from education. I've spent the last 30 years of my life either as a student, a professor, or working in campus ministry relating to students and professors. Ratio Christi is on the campuses. What priority do you think the church ought to put on the mission to and into the universities? Yeah, Ratio Christi uh, and other groups are doing really cutting edge work. This is of such great importance to the church because you can only take your parents' faith so far. At some point, an individual has to resolve for him or herself whether or not I'm going to own this, right? I, I read recently, again, the famous yeah. story about, about uh, Jacob's encounter with his brother Esau. And remember, he has this dream, and this occurs just before the wrestling at the River Yabok uh, with the angel of God. And the dream he has is all about this sense of angst that he has, uh, that he's going to meet his brother and something terrible is, is, is going to happen. Uh, happened to him and uh and 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 should he keep the gods of his fathers of his grandfather abraham and of his father isaac he has to now decide whether god is faithful to him in this moment of crisis in his life as he's coming back from mesopotamia and returning to the land of canaan and that's a watershed moment for him in his life we all have watershed moments where we have to decide whether the god of our father and mother is going to be our God. 
And I found that the time when that mostly happens, and it happened for me at that time, was the time when I entered college. I left high school. I went to college, right? Because this is the time of transition. Mm-hmm. This this is yeah, moving out of the parents' household. Granted, you still stay very closely connected in college mm-hmm. for a time, but now you're pretty much out on your own. You're starting that process, and you're going to have to decide. Your your own peers now are becoming more a more important group for you than your own parents. So now you have to make a choice and a decision. And as you know, in colleges today, overwhelmingly. They're on one side of the spectrum, right. and it's the side favoring the Christian faith, right? Including on this sexuality issue, but of course, all across the board. And so, they need a countervailing voice, a reasoned presentation that the God of their fathers is not and mothers is not unreasonable, but actually makes perfect sense of the world, of the universe, of the creation as we see it. And that Jesus's call to them is absolutely critical. And it's a total call. It's not a not a little minor makeover. It's a total home makeover for them that Jesus is looking for them to get. So to have a faithful group present a reasoned presentation for the faith that makes a total demand on an individual's life, there's hardly any more important work that could be done. Amen. You know, I think that as goes the university, so goes the culture, as goes the U.S. university, so goes the world, at least right now. And uh, I think the church needs to put more of a premium on it. It's, in my view, one of the greatest omissions of the Great Commission if we fail to recapture the universities for Christ. So I appreciate the work you're doing, appreciate you as a brother, and uh, it's been a pleasure to spend uh, today with you. Thank you. God's blessings to you and the blessings to the whole Ratio Christi organization. (laughs) 